Hello and welcome to Slap on Location Episode 3, where we dig up the grave of NASCAR's second super speedway ever built, Raleigh Speedway. Welcome to episode three of Slap on Location, again here in Raleigh at the site of the old Raleigh Speedway. Uh, I know Halloween is over, but if you like scary stories, this is a place uh, where you can go out and tell a few ghost stories. This was the site of Black uh, Saturday back in 1953. Uh, there's almost nothing left of the track. They've just demolished everything, made a power substation out here, a couple of buildings uh, for uh, an industrial park. Uh, but supposedly out here in the woods on either side of this uh, substation uh, is the paved remains of the track. The track was one mile in length. Uh, it was just a long paper clip configuration, had 16 degree banks. Um, it was the only uh, speedway that was a mile in length or longer that was paved besides Darlington. And it was also the first track to be a mile in length that was uh, lit. So you could also have night races out here. And the problem, with, the main problem with the track was it, the lights just weren't really that good. For a half mile track, if, uh, it's, if it's fairly dimly lit, uh, you can still kind of see everything because you don't have to worry about the, the distances from the press box and everything. The problem with this track was it was so long and it was so dimly lit that the guys up in the press box and race control couldn't actually see every uh, nook and cranny of the track for, while the races were going on. And there was a modified race out here in September 19th, uh, 1953. And Bill Blevins was driving a, a, what was a burgundy car. And his, he had stalled during the pace laps. They got it refired again. He had stalled again on the back stretch. Uh, the PA announcer spotted him out there and was saying, don't start the race, don't start the race. Uh, apparently, NASCAR officials uh, did not hear that. They started the race anyway. Uh, they, all the cars go through turn one. Uh, the leaders, uh, all the Flock brothers, uh, Buck Baker, I believe, was in that race. Uh, they miss him. Guys in the back couldn't react fast enough, and they slammed into uh, the back of Bill Blevins. I think there were something like 12 cars involved in the crash. Uh, Bill Blevins died instantly. Supposedly, by all accounts, it was Jesse Midkiff that hit Bill Blevins. Uh, he died uh, instantly. Bill Blevins was 24. Jesse Midkiff was 19. Uh, this was uh, one of their first uh, in a series of modified races. There were uh, 60 cars that started the race that night. Uh, there were supposed to be 69 cars. There was supposed to be uh, several rows of three cars each, or several columns of uh, three cars wide. Uh, and it was supposed to be billed as the next big thing for modified uh, stock car racing. Bill France was the promoter of the track. It was his idea to have a 220 lap main event here. Um, unfortunately, the race just never really took off. Obviously, after uh, the fatalities, an interest in having a, a big modified race here died off pretty quickly. And the locals hated this track. At the moment it was built, the locals didn't like it. This was actually a residential area at the time, and they built the track kind of just in the middle of it. And there weren't any zoning laws uh, in Raleigh at that time. And so they built the track here, and everybody complained about the noise. They actually got a countywide ban for stock car racing on Sundays. And so they had the race here at 8 o'clock on a Saturday night and uh, after an 80 minute delay uh, to clean up the track and uh, get all the injured people out of the track and get the cars off the track, uh, they restarted the race and it ended just before midnight. That however was a modified race. The Cup Series raced here eight times uh, from 1953 to 1958 and they raced here twice in 1955. Fonte Flock won the very first race here, and it was also the last race for his co-pilot, uh, Jocko Flacco, who was uh, a little monkey he'd have with him inside the car. For whatever reason, this, this monkey didn't seem to mind the noise and everything, but uh, according to Fonte Flock, he had a little trap door where he could look at the left front tire uh, from where he was on the driver's side of the vehicle. He could pull up a chain and look at his tire to make sure it was still good and everything. Well. Uh, Jocko Flacco had been watching Fonte pull up that trap door so often uh, 
the monkey wanted to try it too. So he yanked the chain, uh, lifted up the trap door, and then a rock came and popped him in the head. And he didn't like that. He, he was, uh, didn't get knocked out, didn't kill him or anything. He was just really upset, it got hurt. Uh, and so he, he ran up on Fonty's shoulder and just started messing with him, pulling on his, uh, his uh, fire suit, uh, pulling on the belts, trying to get his uh, goggles off and everything. So he actually had to stop, make a pit stop to get Jocko out of the car. And according to Fonty Flock, that was the only time that a NASCAR stock car ever stopped to get a monkey out of the car. All right, so apparently the paved section of the back stretch is still out here, which is irony would have it is the actual section of the track where uh, Bill Blevins and Jesse Midkiff died. So uh, if you dig through enough pine needles, supposedly you can see the, remain, the remains of the back stretch uh, over here and uh, over here on the other side. There's still a little bit left. So we're going to go poke around in the woods over here and see what we can find. And uh, one more thing before we get started, I got to thank NASCAR Man History and Brock Beard uh, for their video on Black Saturday and the Raleigh Speedway. Without them, I really wouldn't have even known this track was out here. Uh, we had made plans to go out to the North Carolina State Fairgrounds and uh, do a shot out there. And when I uh, saw their video on it, and I was like, well, I'm going to be in Raleigh. Let's see how far away this is. And it was only like a 15 minute drive up the road. So we decided to come out here. So uh, big thanks to those two guys. Uh, links to their channels down in the description and uh, you can subscribe to them on the end screen at the end of the video. Well, we didn't have to do too much digging. We just, roads like right over there. And uh, this right here looks like the raised paved section of the track. It's pretty amazing that they, as much building up as they did out here, they didn't uh, just let this whole spot alone except for the substation over there. They just graded all that out and then just left this as it was. And, uh, you can see where the rest of the ground is kind of sunk down, uh, but this paved section right here is uh, the only thing that remains really. You gotta do some digging to get down to it, but there's the asphalt of the track. Here's where it's kind of raised up a little bit where these trees right here put their roots down, just brought up everything. It really is amazing what nature can do in about 50 years time or so and just take everything over. Didn't have any uh, calcium chloride to help us this time. Instead, it was just uh, the asphalt that kind of kept everything from growing up too bad and allowed us to be able to find this really just so easily. Uh, it's pretty obvious that there was a road here or a racetrack or something. Uh, it's not like Air Base Speedway where you would think that that was just an oddly straight clearing right there if you didn't know any better. But here there was obviously a, either a road or a racetrack or uh, some sort of access road to the substation or something at one point. So the Raleigh Speedway was supposed to be the next big thing. It was it's supposed to be Darlington Part 2. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, just after uh, Black Saturday happened, of course, all the locals being uh, just tired of the noise all the time. Uh, they had a quarter mile track on the infield where they do weekly races. And of course they had the big one mile track, uh, but it just never took off. People really didn't like the track that much, uh, especially uh, just the city council, uh, county council. They just did everything they could to take out this speedway. And honestly, just the configuration, a, a one mile paper clip, is pretty dangerous configuration. If you had a hung throttle or your brakes failed, uh, you were pretty much a dead man. Uh, Martinsville can get away with it because it has lower banking and it's only a half mile, but even then Martinsville was still considered a pretty dangerous track. And this was right up there with Langhorn is probably one of the most dangerous tracks on the circuit. So this is the side of the back stretch, which ran along right next to this uh, uh, just drop off right here. The back stretch wall, as far as I could tell, was actually just a guardrail and I couldn't find any stories of anybody hopping the guardrail and ending up down in this ravine back here, but uh, it definitely <laughs> probably happened at some point. Uh, I know uh, Whitey Suttles, a uh, local legend back in my hometown of Greenville, he had hopped the curb over at uh, Greenville Pickett Speedway a number of times and ended up in Blackwell's Lagoon. So if, uh, if he could do that, somebody definitely hopped the guardrail and ended up uh, down here. The back stretch was just lined with trees. Uh, you can tell some of those trees down there are a little bit older than the ones up here. Uh, and 
that was part of what contributed to uh, Bill Blevins and um, Jesse Midkiff's death. Is uh, it was just hard to see the, uh, Bill Blevins' burgundy car on the uh, dimly lit track on the back stretch, just lined with trees. It just kind of blended in, and NASCAR officials uh, unfortunately didn't see it when they threw the initial green flag. All right, so there's about a total of about 90 feet of paved section left in this part, and it continues on past uh, the substation down there where they graded it out, and it goes back up to level ground, and there's some more backstretch uh, over there. Uh, and a fun fact about this uh, racetrack, the last race was supposed to be in 1959. It was on the schedule. The problem was uh, uh, Bill France wanted IndyCar to race on the 4th of July, over at the Daytona International Speedway. Uh, but unfortunately, it was just so dangerous and so fast that the IndyCar drivers just said they weren't gonna do it and they just canceled the race. Well, Bill France was the promoter here, but he owned Daytona. And he needed a race because he'd already sold a bunch of tickets and he already had people ready to camp out and everything. So he decided, all right, everybody here in Raleigh, pack up your stuff, we're going to Daytona uh, for the 4th of July race over there. They just completely just yeeted Raleigh off the schedule in favor of Daytona uh, and that's how the Firecracker 400 uh, came to pass. That's why it was run on the 4th of July uh, for I think all the way until uh, the mid to late 80s. So Raleigh Speedway played uh, an integral part in getting the NASCAR schedule at, to the point where we know it today where we have that uh, midsummer break at Daytona. It has been going on since really Daytona International Speedway's uh, inception in 1959. After that, they just never came back to Raleigh. It was it was kind of a headache to deal with the Saturday night racing. It was kind of dangerous. Uh, guys were getting injured or, or, or killed, as, as was the case in the 1953 modified race. And it was just too much of a headache. And Bill France kind of made an executive decision and said, well, instead of going out here and going through hell every year at this racetrack, why don't we just go to Daytona? Uh, it's a big racetrack. I'll actually line my own pockets that way instead of uh, making money for these other people and just being the promoter at this track. So that is all that remains of the Raleigh Speedway, one of NASCAR's failed gambles. Uh, the track changed hands uh, in ownership quite a number of times, so it wasn't like it was just one guy who couldn't make it work. Uh, just a lot of people tried. They brought IndyCar here, modified stock cars, uh, NASCAR raced here uh, all the way until 1959, what would have been the last race here, ended up getting uh, traded off in favor of a second race at Daytona. But really just the only th evidence you can find of a track is uh, the paved section over there coming out of turn two. Uh, the rest of the back stretch is uh, just completely overgrown, got a lot of junk over it. We barely found any evidence of uh, the back stretch back there at all. Really it was my cameraman tripping over a piece of, of uh, pavement out there was what gave it away and that was all we could find. Uh, but Everything else around here is just really just overdeveloped. We've got the substation, uh, Diamond Hill plywood over there, a bunch of other places in this sort of industrial park. Uh, I know uh, Dig That Beep that uh, went took the uh, metal detectors over at Airbase Speedway. I think they'd have a, a lot of luck out here because some of the infield is still undisturbed over there where, where we found the paved section. And I think if they brought their metal detectors out there, they could probably have a field day. I know it's a little bit out of their area, it's about a four hour drive for them, uh, but I'm sure they'd have a good time out here. But that's everything that remains of the Raleigh Speedway, so until next time, we'll catch you later. And so that is all that remains of the Raleigh Speedway. While everyone who built and operated the ill-fated track had greatness in mind, only tragedy and failure would come about from this endeavor of speed out in central North Carolina. Not much of the Speedway is left, but eerily the only part that remains is the site of Blevins and Midkiff's fatal accident. Again, I'd like to thank Brock Beard and NASCAR Man History's video on the subject. Had it not been for their efforts in telling the story of Black Saturday, I would have had this nearly forgotten piece of NASCAR history slip right underneath my nose. Thanks to them, I was able to come out here and see it for myself. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of NASCAR's second super speedway. And until next time, y'all take it easy.